Hey everyone, welcome to the video series for Module 4. Um, this is going to start off with Module 4.1, which is just our introductory to the integument system. Um, as always, you can see the learning outcomes listed here, and these are directly correlated to what is on your study guide for this unit, as well as how I make my quiz questions and the test questions. Hopefully, since this is after the first exam, you have a brief introduction to that. So just as an introduction to this, um, skin is your most accessible but often your least appreciated organ system. And um, like I said, the skin, or you can call it the integument, accounts for approximately 16% of your body weight. It covers about 1.5 to 2 meters squared. Um, it's constantly worn away, attacked by microorganisms, radiated by the sunlight, and exposed to all of these harsh environmental conditions and chemicals. So it needs to be constantly replenished and replaced. Um, it's composed of two major components. You have the cutaneous membrane, which contains the epidermis, and then the dermis, and then you have some accessory structures that are in that. So things like nerve fibers, corpuscles, hair follicles, erector pili muscles, oil glands, sweat glands, arteries, veins, all sorts of things that form the cutaneous network. And beneath that's the hypodermis, which is sort of weird here. It separates the integument from the fascia around in the deeper organs. So it's a layer, but it's not part of the integument. Here you can see the functions of the integument system. So we'll highlight these as we go through everything. But essentially what you need to remember from this is protection, excretion, maintenance, uh, maintenance of body temperature or thermoregulation. You can see that listed in two places at the top at the bottom there. You have the production of melanin, which helps for pigmentation, production of keratin, which protects against some abrasions. You have synthesis of some of the vitamins that we have, like vitamin D, storage of lipids, and then it has a sensory component of well in the detection of touch, pain, pressure, and temperature. So as we get into the layers of the skin, we start with the epidermis. Okay, and the epidermis is composed of layers with various functions. It's dominated by things called ker keratinocytes, which are the body's most abundant epithelial cells. And these cells form several layers called strata. We already talked in the last um, little bit about what strata actually is. So in this, you have the thin skin, which covers most of the body's surfaces, contains about four strata and is about as thick as the wall of plastic sandwich bag. So pretty small. You have the thick skin, which occurs on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet possesses five strata, and it's about as thick as a standard paper towel or so. And then note that the terms that thick and thin kind of refer to the relative thickness of the epidermis and not to the integument as um, a whole itself. So there are several strata of the epidermis. So we're going to get into those here. Now we're going to go through all of these in pretty good detail, but this just highlights uh, a brief introduction of this. So we'll start off with the stratum corneum here, which is the outermost layer of keratinocytes, sometimes called the horny layer. It's about a broad zone with 15 to 30 layers of keratinized cells that account for about three quarters of the epidermal thickness. Um, keratinization is the formation of protective superficial layers of the cell with keratin. And then the dead cells in each layer of the stratum corneum remain tightly interconnected by desmosomes. We talked about desmosomes when we talked about the last um, Thing in the tissue section. And then dead cells generally remain in the exposed stratum corneum from about two weeks before they're shed or washed away. Remember, these things continue to replenish and replace at all times. Um, and there's a certain uh, waterproof uh, capability to this as well, performed by glycolipids. And that's important because you don't want water um, diffusing easily through the skin here. I would pay special attention to this picture. We're going to see it several times. Moving on, we go to the stratum mucetum. It's the thick skin of the palms and the soles that have a stratum mucetum. In the other areas, it's not technically there. Um, and this separates the stratum corneum from the deeper layers beneath it. And the cells of this layer are flattened and densely packed, large. Don't, they lack organelles, and they're filled with proteins um, called keratin and kerathylin. Most of the time, by the time that everything reaches the stratum lucium, the cells are dead and undergoing dehydration at this point. 
continuing to the stratum granulosum, and it consists of three to five cell layers where the keratinocytes appearance begin to change. This is where we start seeing um, the product of that diffusion rate up into living cells here. So these cells become flattened and the plasma membrane becomes less permeable. Organelles begin to deteriorate at this time. Um, remember, we're going from top to bottom here. So we're going to start, we're going from dead sin cells getting down to alive ones. So by the time the cells reach this layer, they've stopped dividing and they've started making large amount of keratin and they're stored in numer numerous visible granules. You can see in the stratum granulosum how it's a very thick band here and that's produced from the keratin that's in there. Okay, And beyond this layer, there is no nutrient availability. So that's why you have a bunch of dead skin cells at the top there. Moving on to the fourth layer, the stratum spinosum has about eight to 10 layers of keratinocytes that are bound together again by desmosomes and microfilaments. Okay, the name stratum spinosum means the spiny layer, and it refers to the fact that the cells kind of look like miniature pin cushions in histological sections. So when you see this in histology in the integument unit in lab, they're going to look a little spiky. Again, you can kind of see how that looks here. This also has a large number of dendritic cells found in this layer, and we'll get more to what dendritic cells are when we get into nervous tissue and things like that. We'll go over that. And essentially, these are specialized cells that participate in part of the immune system by stimulating defense mechanisms against microorganisms that are able to penetrate the superficial layers and help with superficial skin cancers. The final layer of the epidermis here is the stratum basale. And this is the deepest epidermal layer that contains a single row of basal cells or germinative cells. And they are undergoing rapid mit uh, mitotic divisions. And that's in order to replace all of the cells up above. And you can see that layer here. You have hemidesmosomes in this section. So I remember back to what those are in the tissue section. And these essentially attach the cells to the, this layer of the basal lamina that separates the epidermis from the areolar tissue of the adjacent papillary layer of the dermis. We'll get to what the papillary layer is in just a second. So you have about 10 to 25% of these cells that contain melanocytes, which produce melanin. It helps to give skin its pigmentation. And in hairless skin, you have specialized cells called Merkel cells, which exist in some small numbers. And these are sensitive to touch when compressed. And they also release chemicals that can stimulate some sensory nerve endings. So as we get into this, you'll start to see the deeper layers of the epidermis that forms from the epidermal ridges. Okay, and these extend into the dermis and are adjacent to dermal projections that are called dermal papillae. And they project upward into the epidermis. You can see those ridges here. And they help to firmly bind the epidermis to the dermis by increasing the surface area for attachment. Okay. And these ridge patterns in the thick skin on the surface of the fingertips are help to produce the fingertips, which are unique to all people. And they used to identify individuals in criminal investigations for a very long time just because of their uniqueness to each person. Um, you should, in the integument portion in lab, go over some of the um, types of fingerprints that you see, some of the features inside of each fingerprint. And like all other epithelial, the epidermis lacks blood vessels, which means that things have to diffuse to the upper layers. Epidermal cells um, rely on, again, diffusion of nutrients and oxygen from the capillaries within the dermis. And as a result, the cells with the highest metabolic demand are usually closer to the underlying dermis, which is why you start to see um, the stratum basale, which is that bottom layer, contain most of the um, metabolic action. All right, getting to the dermis. The dermis helps to support the epidermis, and the hypodermis connects the dermis to the rest of the body. All right? So the dermis lies between... The, again, the epidermis and the hypodermis, and consists of two layers. You have the papillary layer, which has a highly vascularized areolar or tissue and has several different cell types within it. It also contains capillaries, lymphatic vessels, sensory neurons that supply the surface of the skin, 
and it gets its name from the dermal papillae that project into the epidermal ridges. Remember to help adhere that by increasing the surface area. Again, this layer nourishes and supports the epidermis by diffusion. Underneath that, you have the reticular layer, which consists of an interwoven meshwork of dense irregular connective tissue containing both collagen and elastic fibers. You have bundles of collagen fibers that extend superficially, which means above it, to blend into those layers of the papillary layer and deeply to bend with the hypodermis. Collagen fibers help to provide strength, while the elastic fibers help to provide flexibility. Okay. It also restricts the spread of pathogens, helps to store lipids, attaches skin to the deeper tissues beneath it, possesses sensory receptors, and contains blood vessels for temperature regulation. As we get into um, <clears throat> a little bit more of the specifics within these layers, we start to see things that are called cleavage lines. So within the dermis, the collagen and elastin fibers are arranged in parallel bundles and oriented to resist forces that are applied to the skin during normal movements. What happens as a result of that is that fiber bundles establish a line of cleavage. And these lines are clinically significant. So in a way that they cut um, a parallel cleavage line will usually remain closed and heal with a little scarring, where a cut at a right angle to a cleavage line will be pulled open as movement occurs. So in order to reduce scarring, if you cut along these cleavage lines, you'll be able to do that, which is something that you'll learn if you go into surgery. Beneath all these things, you have the hypodermis, which remember is not technically a part of the integument. But the hypodermis separates skin from the deeper tissue structures. It helps to stabilize the position of the skin in relation to underlying tissues, such as skeletal muscles or other organs, while also permitting an independent movement. But because it's often dominated by adipose tissue, the hypodermis often also represents an important site for insulation, cushioning, and the storage of energy reserves. And at puberty, men accumulate subcutaneous fat at the neck and on the arms, along the lower back, and over the buttocks. And in, contra in contrast to that, women accumulate subcutaneous fat at the breast, buttocks, hips, and thighs. And in both genders, there are almost no fat cells on the back of the hands and feet, but are disinteresting large numbers in the abdominal region. This helps to result in the pot belly. This kind of happens at the accumulation of those adipocytes in the hypodermal layer.